In deciding how Witness would give prominence to human rights stories from around the world, I was really reminded of an anthology by Professor Beverly Guy Sheftall of my beloved alma mater, Spelman College, entitled Words of Fire. Included in those fiery words were a charge from tonight's speaker, celebrated activist, educator, and professor Angela Davis. Professor Davis besought Black women as heirs to tradition of supreme perseverance and heroic resistance to hasten to take our places wherever people are forging on towards freedom. Tonight's program is that place. It is in this space that we will speak to current times highlighting that COVID-19 is a pandemic and a human rights crisis, a crisis that is disproportionately affecting black and brown communities on a global scale. I'm sure that I sound a bit partial in saying that we have a great program coming up, but I make no apologies in ensuring you that we do. Poignant conversation with Professor Davis and media activist Palika Makam, that moment for joy I mentioned earlier with a rock and blues performance from Kimberly Nicole, and up next, activist and witness founder Peter Gabriel with reflections on COVID-19. So as we begin the program, I'd like to once again extend this welcome to all of you tuned in from witness and executive director Yvette Albergink Time, who we will hear from after these words from Peter Gabriel. Hi, this is Peter Gabriel in lockdown and in London. Um, this COVID-19 experience is a very strange thing for most of us. Uh, and it's not just a health and economic crisis, but it's also a human rights crisis. And many of the most vulnerable communities around the world that get picked on and abused in all sorts of ways are suffering much more now the extraordinary powers that governments have given themselves, quite rightly, to protect their citizens, where there are bad actors are being abused and people are really suffering. So I'm delighted that Yvette and her amazing team have created the COVID-19 Response Hub. Uh, these are stories that need to be told and need to be heard, and that's always been Witness's job. So I got asked to to respond to COVID and write something. And um, I've written some words, which I'll read. Um, they may become a song in the future, but right now it's a text. And it's called, Who Will Wear the Crown? The alien conquerors coming to town. Nobody knows who'll be wearing his crown till we count out the numbers and know just who's down or the alien conquerors coming to town. A moment's been caught and the boat goes adrift. It's duty and love and life their last gift. And we cheer for this front line as they head for their shift. We're alone, we're together, and there's the lift. And friends, they're drowning as boats come apart. So many cut short, so much hurt in the heart. We all come to naught when we share out this crown as the kings and the queens of each family fall down. Stars up above us on this empty London street, a springtime's full of life alive, the air so soft and sweet. The world is turning once again, and when the wheel will stop, the world will form as something else, and then the coin will drop. Out come all the questions, the questions we don't ask, as we close in from a distance and stay protected by the mask. And for all of you who've fallen, no more is it your task. We'll make sure that light's infectious, that's still glowing in your cask. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for your inspirational and, as usual, beautiful words. I hope they bring comfort to those of us who have lost family and friends to COVID. I know that they inspire all of us 
to build a better future together. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you all for joining us today, literally from all over the world. It warms my heart. To our partners and fellow activists, thank you so much for all your collaboration, for your courage. Your response to this pandemic is what motivates us every day. To our community of allies and supporters, and particularly the Witness Board, thank you for being with us when it actually really, really matters. It is your support that makes this work possible. Because COVID-19, as Denise mentioned and Peter said, it's not just a health crisis, it is a human rights crisis. This pandemic has made visible in extraordinary ways, why it is that we fight for human rights for every single human being on this planet. For dignity, for access to health, and for equality. Because COVID-19 has propelled authoritarian governments and the supposed democratic ones as well to use this crisis to grab more power and to continue to target and to marginalize our communities. Media is being weaponized and the truth manipulated. Yet at the same time, in this chaos, one thing that has become exceptionally clear, it's the possibility to realize the world we all can live in. And it is our job at Witness to support the brave activists, those frontline workers, and the storytellers. We've stepped up our support to thousands of defenders and community leaders around the world with the launch of the COVID-19 Response Hub. Through training and guidance, we're helping activists use video to lift the truth, to capture and share authentic narratives and make human rights change happen. It is also our job at Witness to advocate to those tech giants on behalf of so many of us, but particularly the most vulnerable communities, so that their platforms and technologies stop spreading harmful hate and can safeguard vital visual evidence of abuses and serve up trusted information. This is essential to a just democracy. This is a defining historic moment for all of us. What you do, it actually matters. Let the bullies and the abusers manipulate our reality as we know it, or will you choose community and stand for human dignity, for human rights for all? I think that your choice is clear, and I think we cannot do this without you. Thank you. And now it's my honor and succinct privilege to hand the mic over to Professor Davis. She's a celebrated activist, an educator, and author. Professor Davis has been deeply involved in movements for social justice around the world through her activism and her scholarship over many decades. Her work as an educator, both at the university level and in the larger public sphere, has always emphasized the importance of building communities of struggle for economic, racial, and gender justice. Over her illustrious teaching career, Professor Davis has taught at a range of schools, including San Francisco State University, Mills College, UC Berkeley, and Stanford University. Most recently, she spent 15 years at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she is now distinguished professor Emerita of History of Consciousness, an interdisciplinary PhD program and feminist studies. And Professor Davis will be in conversation with my colleague, Palika Makam. Palika is a media activist using video as a tool for advocacy in her work. And she's Witness US Senior Program Coordinator, focused on advocating for the rights of immigrants, incarcerated individuals, and other marginalized communities throughout the country. Palika has produced video advocacy campaigns and trained activists all over the world, from Ferguson to the West Bank. 
Currently, she's an emerging activist fellow with the Social Change Initiative, and she's a recipient of the Coaching Fellowship for Young Women Leaders. She holds a BA in Journalism and Social and Cultural Analysis from NYU, and an MA in International Affairs concentrating in Human Rights and Media from the New School. She is, maybe most importantly, the proud daughter of immigrants and the South Asian diaspora community that raised her. Please join me in welcoming Professor Davis and Palika Makam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise and Yvette, for the introduction and for producing this much needed event. Hello, Professor Davis. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. It is such an honor to be in conversation with you tonight, especially right now. You know, I know it's clear we're in a moment of great peril, but I think we're also in a moment of great possibility. Arundhati Roy called this pandemic a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And I believe that people are starting to question our ways of life, examine our relationship with the earth and what our responsibilities are to each other. And it gives me hope that we might possibly walk through that gateway into the next world with a vision to free ourselves from the structural inequities that got us here in the first place. And one of my very favorite things about reading your work or hearing you speak, Professor Davis, is that no matter the topic or time, you're always able to manifest beauty and struggle in, in, and possibility in struggle um, and remind me that hope is an action that must be practiced daily. So I'd like to ground this evening in that idea and offer hope as a call to action to everyone around the world tuning in tonight. And in that spirit, could you start us off this evening by telling us about an image or video or action you've seen anywhere around the world during this global pandemic that's given you hope or made you feel optimistic for our future? Well, first of all, um... Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this uh, ungala. Uh, and it's an honor to be associated with the important work that Witness is doing uh, around the world. Uh, if I think of um, an event, an image um, that has um, affected me deeply during this uh, period, I suppose I would say um, images of a demonstration that took place last Saturday outside of the walls of San Quentin prison uh, here in the Bay Area. I'm um, uh, located in Oakland, uh, California. And as you know, um, uh, prisons are cauldrons uh, you know, for this, this virus. Uh, and very little has been done to guarantee that those who are inside will be safe. Uh, and so uh, last Saturday, a demonstration was organized uh, by the, 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 the Labor um, Committee to free Mumia Abu Jamal uh, to support all of the prisoners uh, inside San Quentin and to draw attention to uh, the fact that during this period, which really is an era of the prison industrial complex all over the world, there are vast numbers of people uh, who are especially vulnerable to COVID-19. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's actually the same imagery that I think has given me a lot of strength during this time is, you know, seeing the way that incarcerated individuals in jails and prisons and detention centers are using these very creative and brave strategies to make sure that the world knows what's happening inside of those walls. You know, we've seen incarcerated folks use video vis visitation software and actually hold up signs that explains what they're experiencing when they don't feel safe to talk it out loud. Um, you know, we saw powerful pictures of immigrants in a detention center in Washington state who actually formed their bodies into the SOS distress signal that could be seen <clears throat> from above the detention center. And here at Witness, our US team has also been working to amplify stories from incarcerated individuals. We've been training and supporting public defenders to, to 
record phone and video interviews with their clients, with their clients' communities and loved ones about COVID-19 in order to help get folks released. And we've actually had some success in getting a few people out of Rikers. You know, like you said, we know prisons are not safe. They're not sanitary. There's no way to social distance in there for the more than 2.3 million people who are incarcerated in the United States, States, which is more than any country on earth. And so I'd love to hear more from you, Professor Davis, about how we can apply an abolitionist lens to this moment, you know, from police to ICE to prison, and how we can make sure the voices of incarcerated people are at the center of the fight to free people from all cages. Well, it's, it's absolutely clear that the only effective strategies now to safeguard the lives of, of those who are in prisons and immigrant detention uh, facilities uh, um, all over the world are abolitionist strategies, uh, decarceration. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting that this is so self-evident, uh, uh, but very few governmental officials have actually made the move to engage in large-scale decarceration. Uh, um, as I said, this is an abolitionist strategy. And if we were not already convinced uh, that uh, we need to, to take steps to reduce and the, the, the population of people inside prisons and eventually um, um, abolish prisons and, and think about other ways uh, to uh, develop a more meaningful system of, of, of justice. Uh, uh, this is, I, I, I really liked um, uh, the, the way in which you use Arundhati Roy's notion of the um, COVID-19 crisis as being a, a portal. Uh, um, leading us uh, to a different future. Uh, many people are expecting the world to revert to the way it was before. Uh, and of course, uh, we will not be going backwards. Uh, uh, we will not be returning to normalcy as we experienced it prior to the, the, the crisis. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping um, increasing numbers of, of people um, are aware of is the extent to which this crisis is revealing uh, the way in which global capitalism is associated uh, with violence and, and, and repression and, um, and, and, and has made it virtually impossible for us to recognize who the important people are in the world. Now we have this category called essential workers. Uh, and we are, um, we, we are aware of the fact that we would not be able to lead our lives as we are leading them uh, as we shelter in place. Uh, were it not for the fact that um, People are working to guarantee that we have food, uh, uh, to guarantee that we have health care, uh, and all of the things that we need in order to survive. Uh, and of course, the vast majority of these essential workers are people of color. Uh, so we're learning more about structural racism as well, precisely those people who are valued least in our society, those people who have always been vulnerable uh, in, in so many ways, too innumerable to mention in terms of health care, in terms of food, in terms of jobs, in terms of education, et cetera, are precisely the people who make life possible on this globe. Uh, and so I'm hoping that uh, as we move toward a new phase, uh, that uh, awareness will assist in developing a stronger consciousness of the need to be aware of the damages that capitalism has done to humans, uh, to other animals, and to the planet. 
Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, you know, I, I, I've talked about images of um, mass incarceration here in the United States, but we know that the United States is not the only place uh, where mass incarceration is an issue, which leads me to kind of the next thing I wanted to ask you about. You know, in your work, you always stress the importance of applying a global framework to our movements. You, know, you talk about the need to wake up from our dream of American exceptionalism. And I cannot think of a better time to do that than the present. Rio just had a record year of police killings and brutal police operations are continuing in favelas despite COVID-19. The latest victim was a 14 year old, Joao Pedro, but from Rio to here in the United States, to South Africa, to Argentina, we're seeing videos of state forces perpetuating human rights abuses under the guise of, you know, enforcing social distancing orders. And we know how powerful it can be when global movements do connect. You know, I remember being in Ferguson after Mike Brown Jr. was killed and Palestinian activists were tweeting Ferguson activists tips for how to deal with tear gas. I know that you've, you've written about this as well. And so before we hear questions from a few members of Witnesses Global team, I'd love to hear from you tonight about how we can foster global connection right now and why it's so important that we learn, learn from each other. Well, thank you so much for that question, um, Palika. I think that um, global solidarities are most important uh, um, for this period and for the future. Um, uh, we are witnessing um, conditions that reveal to us that uh, the whole um, the very notion of the, the independent nation state um, is no longer viable. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, if one considers the extent to which um, immigrants uh, all over the world are subject to the worst kinds of uh, political repression, uh, uh, incarcerated in immigrant detention centers. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we know that with respect to the prison industrial complex, immigrant um, detention centers constitute the most profitable area of, of, of private prisons. Uh, and, and so knowing this, uh, we, should, um, we, we should recognize that something is very wrong with the um, uh, fact that um, information travels, uh, corporations travel, capital travels. Everything is 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 flowing across national borders during this era of global capitalism. But when, of course, people join that flow, they're considered illegal. Uh, and, 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 and so I think we, we have to begin to question the very notion of borders. Uh, and you know, certainly I think this um, pandemic should uh, further illuminate uh, of what has become obsolete under conditions of, of, of globalization. Uh, and I think it's our responsibility to, uh, to um, guarantee that uh, uh, we generate solidarities for people struggling in Brazil, uh, in India, uh, in Kurdistan, uh, 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 immigrants throughout uh, the um, European Union uh, who suffer uh, so much. Uh, uh, this is an era, I think, where those of us who consider ourselves um, activists have a special challenge. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, Palestinians who uh, were actually the first to respond to the events in Ferguson in 2014. Uh, uh, they were at the forefront of the development of a global movement of solidarity with people who were supporting those who were protesting the um, killing of Mike Brown. 
and as such help to generate what we now call the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, without Palestinian solidarity, I don't think that that uh, we would have experienced the, you know, such a surge of activism and support. Thank you, Professor Davis. I I feel hopeful that you know this moment can can lend itself to more global solidarity. Um, and on that note, I want to pass it over to a few of my colleagues around the world to ask you questions. First, we're going to hear a question from my colleague Adebayo Okewo, who manages our work in Africa and is based in Abuja, Nigeria. Hi, my name is Adebayo Okewo, and I'm the Africa Program Manager at Witness. I am based in Abuja, Nigeria. In many African countries like Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria, the government have resorted to measures such as lockdowns and curfews to curb the spread of the coronavirus. And in implementing these lockdown orders, they have deployed their police forces. But unfortunately, the police forces have resorted to excessive use of force, and we've seen an uptick in police brutality. And we've come to the knowledge of these instances because of those who courageously took out their cameras to document and film these abuses. Um, and at the same time, though, some of these individuals have faced retaliation from the police officers who were trying to block them from recording and filming the human rights abusers. So my question then is, how can we ensure the safety of such individuals, especially in countries where the right to record has not been fully recognized or is not respected? Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you so much. Uh, for that question. Um, we know that repressive measures that pre-existed the COVID-19 crisis have been intensified under the crisis. Political repression is more intense. Police violence has been intensified all over the world. Uh, here in the US, uh, people are noticing um, that structural racism is even more evident than before. So in answer to your question, I don't know whether I have specific strategies other than the ones we are accustomed to using. Protests, demonstrations, solidarity under the conditions, under the conditions of uh, this current crisis, of course, our actions um, our actions have to be socially distanced. Uh, I mentioned earlier the use of automobiles at a protest that occurred last Saturday at San Quentin uh, Prison with, um, with posters uh, uh, on which slogans were written um, uh, affixed to the side of the automobiles. I think this is a period to where we, we have to be um, creative and of course witness in in using um, in, in in using video recordings uh, to not only um, um, uh, record ab abuses but to encourage resistance as well is very important uh, during this period. So you know I would um, I would say that. Uh, we should use our connections uh, with people in other countries to guarantee that uh, when those who are attempting to uh, record or film human rights abuse abuses themselves come under attack, then we should uh, develop defense mechanisms uh, uh, that call upon people all over the world to uh, protest that repression. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the important work that you are doing, and I wish you much success as you continue. Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, I know that Adebayo and our partners on the ground there really appreciate your response. I actually have a, a follow-up question to my colleague's question. You know, over the last decade, we've seen a lot of videos of police violence around the world. And, you know, those videos have sometimes helped to galvanize public support or combat the official, you know, government or, or law enforcement narratives. And in very rare occasions have led to accountability in a courtroom like here in the United States with the case of Walter Scott. Of course, this depends on what your definition of accountability is. 
But, you know, the for the few videos of police violence that do reach the general public, the public outcry is often, you know, um, to arrest the police officer or to charge the perpetrator of violence. And at Witness, one of our global projects has been to support communities to instead use video as a data point to tell a larger story of systemic or institutional violence. But it's a hard story to tell. And so I'd love to hear from you if you have any advice about how we can move away from that narrative of a single bad actor or single bad you know, police officer towards one that encourages people to examine the system as a whole. Well, of course, this is um, the work that, um, that activists uh, perform. Um, uh, and uh, with respect to police violence, um, there is a history, a long history of struggle against police violence that dates all the way back to um, the era of slavery and its aftermath. Uh, and of course, too often we tend to assume that it is the individual who is um, responsible, and of course individuals uh, should be rendered accountable, uh, but uh, living under conditions of capitalism and which uh, highlight the individual uh, as um, the most important unit of society, there is always the tendency to assume that all accountability resides at the individual level. I think we have learned, especially here in the US, uh, that uh, uh, even as we generate um, resistance against individual police officers and call for their um, um, you know, call for them to be uh, uh, rendered accountable within the framework of uh, criminal justice. Uh, the structural racism and structural violence of police departments continues to exist. You know, there's an example that I think is uh, 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 very illuminating from South Africa uh, that has to do with the Marikana uh, minor strike uh, 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 some years ago. In, in which all of the activists in the horrendous repression and the uh, killing of miners who were striking, all of the actors were black. The miners were black, the police were black, the police commissioners were black women. But nevertheless, the structural racism that uh, is an inheritance from apartheid within police departments continues uh, uh, to exist. And I think that uh, that um, conveys the message that we need to think about different modes of security, that we shouldn't have to rely on uh, these violent police to guarantee security. You know, just as we have um, taken abolitionist perspectives with, in, in order to understand where uh, we might be headed uh, where we can um, see ourselves moving in the future with respect to prisons, uh, just as we call for the abolition of prisons as we know them, we also have to call for the abolition, the abolition of police apparatuses and the creation of new modes of security. Thank you, Professor Davis. Um, so we actually have another question now from my colleague, Dia Kayali, who manages our tech and advocacy work and is based in Berlin. Thank you, Palika, and hello from Berlin, Angela. It's a real honor to get to ask you a question tonight. My name is Dia Kayali, and I lead our tech advocacy work at Witness. One of the things that I work on the most right now is content moderation how companies like Facebook decide what they're going to leave up and what they're going to take down. So I wanna ask you a question about solidarity. You may know that activists from around the world, most recently from Palestine and India, have written many open letters to Facebook and other platforms about their unfair content moderation practices, which silence activists, but also leave up content that contributes to crises like the pogroms against Muslims in Delhi. 
we're trying to amplify each other's voices and build solidarity, but we don't have a lot of clear wins. So do you have any tips on how we can strengthen our solidarity, especially when we can't travel? Well, thank you so much, Dia, for the question. It um, seems that uh, the theme of, of this event, and which should be the theme of our activism, uh, of course, is global solidarity. Uh, and um, I suppose I, I should say again that we know that many of the problems we're facing throughout the world, including the current crisis uh, are linked to globalization, to global capitalism. And unfortunately, I think that as progressive and radical activists, we have not been as consistent as we should have been in building global solidarities, uh, even though the technologies exist. Uh, uh, that uh, didn't exist in the past when we were perhaps more successful in generating global solidarities. Uh, and I, um, I should point out that uh, the very fact that, that, that I um, did not spend the rest of my life behind bars uh, was the um, a direct consequence of the generation of movements of solidarity all around the world at a time when we were not in possession of these technologies. I on snail mail pretty much. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think that, um, that we should be especially focused on, on solidarities. Uh, uh, and although we may not be able to travel at the moment, we can communicate. Uh, 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 we know uh, what is happening in India. We know about the, the terrible um, uh, violence inflicted on Muslim uh, communities uh, in, in Delhi. We know about you know, what is happening in Brazil. We are aware of the intensification of police and military violence under a uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, uh, we know that, 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 that people are struggling in, in, in Palestine, uh, particularly at a time when um, Israel, uh, supported of course by the US, is attempting to engage in a um, practice of more and more annexation. Uh, we know what is happening in Kurdistan. Uh, I, I, what I'm saying is that um, uh, we have always realized that uh, global solidarities are are central to our freedom struggles. Uh, you know, whether we're talking about slavery during the 19th century um, and the fact that 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 Frederick Douglass, for example, appealed to uh, people in Europe and they generated uh, very important solidarity to Ida B. Wells, who called for international solidarity in the campaign against uh, lynching. Um, and of course today, the struggle for climate justice is necessarily one that requires global solidarity. Uh, and I, um, I, I would say that uh, you know all of the creative measures that have been used, uh, particularly by younger activists. Uh, music, for example, helps to generate solidarity. Uh, you know all of these, um, you know, creative uh, means need to be used to guarantee that we are aware of and can express solidarity with our comrades and our sisters and brothers in other parts of the world. Thank you, Professor Davis. It's a great reminder that people were able to engage in global solidarity before the technology we have today, and it should be even more possible for us now. Um, so we have one last question uh, from one of our partners in Brazil, a media maker from Favela Akari named Buba Aguia.
Oi, Ângela, eu sou a Buba Guiar, eu sou comunicadora do coletivo Fala Cari, que é uma favela da Zona Norte do Rio de Janeiro e também estudante de Ciências Sociais. E em uma das aulas, nós estudamos é, uma entrevista sua concedida ao Frank Bará em 2014, né, onde você aponta como o esvaziamento dos presídios é negativo para o processo econômico. Né? E assim como o, o, o encarceramento em massa está diretamente ligado ao, ao lucro empresarial, né? aqui no Brasil, por exemplo, a gente vê como o sucateamento do sistema público de saúde também está ligado a esse mesmo lucro, como isso fomenta o empresariado, o lucro empresarial. Então, como profissional da saúde, que também sou comunicadora e socióloga, é, eu gostaria muito de saber com você um caminho que a gente possa usar é, através da comunicação para chamar a sociedade para a responsabilidade de também nos ajudar a derrubar esse sistema, essa, essa estrutura é, que cada vez mais mói né, corpos negros e empobrecidos. Well, thank you so much uh, for the really important question. Um, yeah, I have um, spent quite a lot of time in Brazil over the last, um, I would say, the last 20 years. Uh, and um, it's clear that, um, unfortunately, Brazil is following in the footsteps of the United States. It, Brazil has become an important hub of the global prison industrial complex. It is third only to China and the United States when it comes to the numbers of people behind bars. And I think you are, uh, you make a very important observation uh, when you speak about the link between the dismantling of public health systems and the use of um, uh, strategies of incarceration to address problems uh, that that ought to be uh, uh, solved uh, in, in, in terms of providing more health care and more education uh, and more jobs, et cetera. Uh, um, the uh, use of, 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 of what is referred to as mass incarceration as a strategy during this era of neoliberalism and global capitalism uh, Uh, basically is one of removing those who are rendered most vulnerable uh, by strategies that emphasize, uh, as you point out, corporate profits, uh, not human uh, need. Uh, and I, I, I think that um, our movements uh, uh, should be uh, more connected, this is a perfect example of why we need global solidarity. Uh, um, I, you know, it's often assumed that, that activists in the US are central and that they set the agendas and that people in other parts of the world should you know, follow us uh, and This, of course, uh, is another example of U.S. exceptionalism. Even those who are attempting to challenge, uh, you know, governmental and corporate policies in the U.S. Uh, are uh, often perceived as uh, those who are the most important activists in the world. And that is not the case. People in the U.S. have a great deal to learn from struggles uh, in, in other parts of the world. And I speak about Brazil um, because I think that uh, um, the work that, for example, black women in Brazil have done over the last period in challenging racism and uh, military, um, the militarization of the police uh, um, uh, has been so uh, important. Marielle Franco, system, a global symbol um, of the um, need to challenge these systems of oppression. And I, um, I, 
I want to uh, congratulate you for the work that you're doing in 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 Brazil. Uh, uh, prior to the election of uh, Bolsonaro, Brazil was really a beacon. Uh, many of us all over the world were looking to Brazil uh, as um, our our beacon of light, uh, uh, and. Um, in the same way we once looked at South Africa. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, given the extremely difficult circumstances under which you struggle today, it is the responsibility of activists all over the world to stand together uh, with you. Thank you, Professor Davis. I know that we have a lot of colleagues and partners on the ground in Brazil who are tuning in today. And so to hear you lift up their work and their struggle, um, I'm sure means a lot. Um, so sadly, we're nearing the end of our conversation, but I think from this discussion tonight, it's clear that this pandemic has laid bare for all to see so many of the structural inequities in our world and the violent limitations of global capitalism. But we've also highlighted how this can be a great moment of reckoning, an opportunity to reflect and build that global solidarity with each other. So I'd like to uh, close this conversation the way we began it, um, thinking a little bit about hope and what we can be hopeful for. So Professor Davis, can you leave us with some closing thoughts about how this can be a moment to lift up some of the most, you know, boldest, most radical demands of our people and imagine a more equitable and just post-pandemic future? Well, during this uh, very difficult period in which we are witnessing so much suffering uh, and and so much death, uh, uh, much of which could have been avoided uh, had uh, uh, the, the, the government and the current um, occupant of, of, of the White House, we don't, uh, we don't pronounce his name because pronouncing his name is a way of according um, power. Uh, uh, as, we, as, as we witness this, uh, uh, this terrible period, uh, we we also see signs of hope, uh, and and I suppose what I would uh, emphasize is the importance of keeping these um, insights and these messages with us as we emerge, as we move to the next. Phase and again, I'll I'll ref refer to the metaphor of the uh, portal, uh, which you introduced from um, Arundhati War, uh, Arundhati Roy. We are moving through a portal, and on the other side, uh, uh, we will be able to strengthen our movements against misogyny and. Um, gender violence. Uh, we will be able to strengthen our campaign against the global prison industrial complex, against uh, racism, uh, against um, the continued use of colonial uh, strategies uh, in um, Palestine, uh, for example. Uh, we will recognize that as indigenous people have proven to be among the most vulnerable uh, uh, populations uh, uh, in this era of the of, uh, of COVID nineteen that um, we have to lift up uh, indigenous insights and uh, recognize uh, that indigenous people uh, are are uh, the first peoples who were also the first resistors. Uh, and um, finally, I would say that it's young people who are uh, 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 moving us uh, in the direction of, of the future. And, and uh, it's young activists who will come up with new and creative ideas. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, the future. It seems to me that uh, we have um, 
uh, recognize that it is possible to effectively stand up against racism and 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 be victorious in in many ways and let us carry that with us uh, as we move on to the next phase Thank you so much, Professor Davis. I feel re-energized and recommitted to ground my activism in intersectionality and in the movement of my comrades and brothers and sisters around the world. Um, and I hope others feel that feeling and can marinate on it and all the calls of action tonight that can lead us towards a better future. Um, but we're not done yet. You know, Alice Walker said, hard times require furious dancing. And so with, uh, with that in mind, I'd like to pass it back to our host, Denise, to share what's next. Thank you so much, Professor Davis, for your time tonight. Thank you. That's correct, Palika. Hard times do require furious dancing. Thank you, Professor Davis, who often highlights that the most beautiful art and music come from the moments when we find time for joy. Kimberly Nicole is the embodiment of radical self-care, rock and blues, and all things Black girl magic. You may have seen her on The Voice, the stage with Bon Jovi, or heard mu original music on the Netflix documentary, by Madam C.J. Walker, self-made, and she's here tonight to sing us up off our couches. Please welcome Kimberly Nicole. Hi, you guys. Thank you to my Spellman sister, Denise. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you, Witness, for all of the amazing work that you are doing around the world. And so much love to Professor Davis, one of my sheroes. It was inspiring hearing you tonight. So this first song I'm gonna do, um, I wrote it some years ago. Um, and I wrote it during a time where I was really feeling discouraged and down and I really didn't know where my life was going. And I felt I was in a dark place, but I just, felt like when you think of sunshine and the many places and obstacles that you've overcome and even people that have come before you, there is some hope. So this song right here, as heard on the Madam C.J. Walker movie self-made on Netflix, this is Little Girl New. Every day I live in the sunshine. Only days went away, and I gotta keep my head above the clouds. About the clouds, and wondering the why or how. Hey, I walk the road and mess travel. Oh, oh, oh. 
All right. That was Little Girl New. And um, the last song I'm going to do, um, I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. Yes, I was. Um, and when I was a little girl, there was a song my sister and I, we loved so much. And um, we tried our best with our young, immature vocals to sing it. But I remember saying to my sister, Christina, Christina, when I get older and go to Spelman, then move to New York, then move to London, I'm here now. Um, I'm going to sing it one day. So here's one of my favorite songs written by one of my favorite songwriters. And I'm going to go out with this. Thank you so much, Witness, for inviting me to be a part of the Ungala. Much love to you guys. Twenty-five years, I'm alive and still trying to get a back, great big hill of hope for a destination. I realized quickly what I do, I should that this world was made up of this brotherhood of remaining for whatever that means. And see, I cry sometimes when I'm lying in bed just to get it all up. What's in my head and I, I'm feeling a little peculiar. And so I wake in the morning and I step outside. I take a deep breath and I get real high. And I scream at the top of my lungs, what's going on? And I say, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I say, hey, what's going on? Thank you. Thank you. I told y'all my Spellman sister was amazing. Thank you for that powerful performance, Kimberly Nicole. As I said before, you can hear songs by Kimberly Nicole wherever you stream your music. And I kind of want to keep the tunes going, but I know we all have to go, I mean, stay home. Um, I want to thank you all, starting with Professor Angela Davis for accepting our invitation, for giving us words on which we can stand during the fight for freedom, and a personal thank you for creating space for little black girls full of fire and magic to show up unapologetically as our true selves. Thank you to Palika Makam. Thank you for taking up space on behalf of brown girls everywhere. You are the present and a formidable part of the brightest future in this work. To Witness founder Peter Gabriel, thank you for your reflections tonight, and we do hope to hear those words in a song soon. To Witness Executive Director Yvette Alberging Thiem, thank you for reminding us of the work needed to actualize the world we all want to live in. Thank you to, to tonight's correspondents, Adebayo Okewo, Buba Aguilar, and Dia Kayali. And to the executive technical producer behind the scenes running all this, John Leslie Morton. And to everyone tuned in, COVID-19 is a heightened crisis for marginalized communities, from migrants to black and brown communities throughout the world. And while we are all navigating this pandemic the best way we know how, we hope that you will support 
witness and help us do our part. If able, please donate via the button below. And if you're watching on Facebook it, or YouTube, it should be in the comments. And stay tuned on social media for regular updates around the world. We appreciate you all for tuning in and hope that you we've left you with hope for the future and a charge to help witness guard the good. Until next time, stay well and stay safe from myself and witness. Good night, everyone.